on the financial markets and the economy. This morning, we'll be looking at post-COVID-19 attracting foreign direct investments into Nigeria. FDIs are very important in supporting development of economies. With me to lead this conversation is Mr. Sheya Detunbi, Chief Responsibility Officer, Value Investing and Comms. And with me in the studio is our co-guest anchor, CEO of Anti Africa Reports, Mr. Boson Omofai. Nice morning. to have you, sir. Good morning. <laughs> Second day and of the week, uh, we heard what the uh, Good morning. 19 presidential tax force said, and it's interesting. Um, yeah, the extension of the lockdown regime for another two weeks. Uh, we have to follow the guidelines and continue to be very, very cautious. Yeah. But FDS, we have to continue to find how we, we, we bring them yeah. in. I mean, we have to be very, very uh, aggressive and robust about it. So, so we'll start, um, Mr. Shea. The report from the National Bureau of Statistics for um, capital importation for the year 2019 showed that we attracted approximately $24 billion. And the last chunk came from foreign portfolio investments, about $16 billion. While foreign direct investment, which we see a lot of advocacy for, just got about a billion dollars. Uh, that shows that there's still a lot to be done in attracting FDIs because the FPI still carries the chunk um, from that. So just to st set the context of overview of the challenges of attracting more FDIs into Nigeria, your thoughts about this? Your question again, I didn't get you. Okay, I, I, I was saying that for the year 2019, full year 2019, the National Bureau of Statistics were able to give us the analysis yes. that we attracted a total of $24 billion in terms of capital importation. The largest chunk came from foreign portfolio yes. investment, about $16 billion, while foreign direct investment was about a $1 billion. Yes. So that shows that we still have a lot of work to do in attracting FDIs. I mean, there were times we used to have over $10 billion in, in a year. So just to set the context for your overview on FDI inflows into Nigeria, Um, as you can see, Nigeria is, is one of the biggest economies in uh, Africa. And from the available information, it came third among the nations that had received the highest inflow of foreign direct investment in the past three years. The the fundamentals are there for Nigeria to attract uh, foreign direct investment because we have the highest GDP, we have the population, we have the market. And to make it more attractive for foreigners, the government has gone ahead with the promulgation of the 1995 um, National Investment Promotion Act to make life easier for foreign investors. So basically, all that is required to attract foreign investors, they are there. My own concern is even more about what will happen post-COVID. Post-COVID in the sense that we are all witnesses to what is happening around us. Businesses are closing down. Um, so in the process, I'm more concerned about the rogue lion that might want to take advantage of the weak institutions post uh, COVID-19. So I'm of the opinion that we should be looking at how to look at the issues, how to protect the distressed bonds so that the fortune of the economy will not further do, uh, dive. Um, okay, uh, Mr. She, I, I hear you very well. We yeah. must protect investment. We must um, strengthen our institutions. Um, we see a lot of activities yeah. from the regulatory space. So policy yeah. clarity and, of course, regulatory flexibility becomes very important in, in, in attracting yeah. these FDI inflows. Like, like you've talked about Nigeria and the, the potentials. We see them. In your recent... Uh, article published on this day, May 14th, you talked about guided uh, 
regulations for FDIs. And there are aspects I'd like you to give clarifications to, and we, we can engage further with both in here. You talked about developing a fresh guideline for FDI and portfolio investors for implementation by key regulators like the Security and Exchange Commission, Central Bank of Nigeria, and the Nigeria Investment Promotion Commission, and other relevant uh, regulatory agencies. If you can give further insight into that uh, thought that you brought up. Okay, if, if you look at the history of Nigerian capital markets, at every point in time, the government intervened in the interest of the economy. Uh, let us take, let me take us back to 1973, the Unionization Decree. It was necessary then to implement or to introduce the guidelines for foreign investment in Nigeria. This was true because most of the real sector players, the former sector players, were dominated by foreign investors. So the, the, the indigenization decree made it possible for indigenous to participate, and the, the existing institutions were required to let go some of their holdings. And the trend continued. That was the era of a um, regulated capital market system. It got to a point that what was in vogue was to liberalize your economy so that you can get foreign investors to come in. And that informed the formal of the 1995 uh, investment promotion degree, which actually gave room for foreign investors to participate in virtually all sectors of the economy and can take ownership up to 100%, except in the oil sector where joint ventures and partnerships are allowed. And now the EU is, we've all experienced a global crisis whereby there has been loss of jobs, loss of income, and there are some sectors that can never be the same again. So what, what a responsible government is required to do is to look at the issues, the, 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 the technocrats in all the um, relevant agencies of the government, they are supposed to look at the existing structure and then let's take stock of institutions that are in distress. And if at all they will have to sell, how can the government come to their aid in terms of regulation such that the, the foreign investors with hidden agenda, with hostile uh, acquisition agenda, will not take over our economy? Because the implication is that when everything has normalized, we realize that virtually all our assets are in, are in the hands of foreigners. So it's something that needs to be looked into um, by way of an intervention. So those are my immediate reactions to, to post-COVID-19 uh, EUs when it comes to digital or foreign direct um, foreign uh, uh, direct yeah, investment. Okay. Even the economies that are well structured that are uh, more, far more developed than more. I'm aware that India mm -hmm. has put some measures in place and they are considering some countries in Europe too uh, are looking at um, a situation whereby uh, any hostile acquisition will not just have a free fall. You know? So I think it's, it's worth looking at. Okay, you, 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 you mentioned that the National Assembly has a very key role to play here, and I'm thinking about some of those uh, bills or legislations that could really um, ensure that the process is effected to, 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 to create that enabler for this investment. For example, the Petroleum Industry Bill has been long overdue for it to be implemented and, and signed so that we can see those investments coming to the oil and gas and energy space. We also look at, I mean, the 
Kama bill, which with respect to be signed and um, transform the whole process, and even the Investment and Securities Act, looking at some areas that can also ensure that regulatory uh, agencies play a, a flexible and very efficient role in ensuring that the market uh, is, provides that guarantee and we're not adversely affected by any investment activity. So what other legislations do you have in mind from the National Assembly? Because you talked about the National Assembly playing a key role here. Thank you for that. Let me respond to that from this perspective. We have an existing law which has given an, an existing act is operational which has given investors 100% uh, opportunity to, to own 100% of our uh, of their investment in in, any, in most of the sectors in uh, in Nigeria, he used where the national assembly comes in is that after the technocrats have looked at the existing guidelines, if there is any need to review any of those things in the act, that will require promulgating another legislation. That's where the National Assembly comes in. But if our regulatory authorities, our gatekeepers, can mayor up and implement the new adjustment within the existing law that doesn't require the attention of the National Assembly, so be it. You know, so that's why I mentioned the issue of uh, uh, that's how National Assembly comes in. And my expectation is that this is an emergency situation. Mm -hmm. And the the legislature, they are, they are part of the populace. They are also, the, we are all locked down for the past uh, one and a half month now. So uh, it is imperative and it is required of them to do the needful and do it with dispatch because it's a life-saving situation because people's, uh, people are out of job and when people are out of job, we all know the implication of the multiplier effect on the economy. Uh, okay, Mr. Bosin, you've had the initial uh, <coughs> thoughts and approach mm -hmm. that Mr. Shea is giving in terms mm -hmm. of the FDIs and uh, the role of National mm -hmm. Assembly and of course looking at our regulations and our policies. I, I agree that we need to uh, look at our policies. Policies uh, are not static so we, we need to keep refining them uh, from time to time but I have a few uh, concerns and and, of, and 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 a few areas here. Uh, uh, first is that we have a, a, a wardrobe. We have a wardrobe full of policies, investment policies in Nigeria. If there's any country yes. that have drafted uh, policies that you need uh, a trailer, a forty footer container to carry all the paperwork on trade policies. We have them. We've written. We've written every since independence. Okay. independence since yeah. independence, every administration have written mountains of paperwork by professors, by the so-called technocrats, by palm sex, by presidents, by state government. They're all there. So that's on one side. Um, have they been effective? The answer is no. Are these, policies been, are, are these policies been able to diversify the economy? The answer is no. Num yeah. Number three, what are the problems with foreign direct investment? The first thing with foreign direct investment is actually not a policy document. It's about who you are as an individual, as a country. You see, by the time an investor sits down in Germany or Switzerland or wherever, and, and they read your policy document online, so they take the next flight and they get to Nigeria. What do they see on the ground at the airports? 
okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is the first part of, of call. Mm -hmm. When they hit the ground running, do they see some measure of good roads? Do they see some measure of organization? Yeah. If they're sending goods or raw materials or machinery, yeah. how do we clear them from MPA to customs to quarantine with all the agencies at the ports? Yeah. Are we living true to the documents of that policy for foreign direct investment? When they touch the ground and they hit the ground to go to a particular state or local government to have discussions with the state governors or ministers or minister of state or palm sex, what's the discussion all about? Are some folks waiting at the reception to help facilitate meeting the governor to start with? Instead of just walking in there, there's an appointment is booked and they have discussion. Or when the discussion is over, does the governor or the state governor or the minister now pass them on to so many others who start creating their own roadblocks to making this foreign direct investment it's happen? Incentives. It's incentives there's nothing, see, there's no patient money anywhere in the world. <laughs> foreign direct investors want to go to where the soil is good. So if you take the parable of the soil in the Bible, if your soil is loaded with hard or is full of thorns mm -hmm. and thistles mm -hmm. investors won't go there so they will go to the fourth type of soil which is good attractive yeah. and it's not rocky mm -hmm. so our environment ab initio we're writing policies on rocky soil of for investors we're writing policies that does not remove the thorns and thistles on the road on the path to direct investment for investors mm -hmm. so until we put policies on one side, then we behave true to the spirit of the policies. And the documents. And the, do and the documents. Wow. And do we have integrity of contracts? Do they believe sanctity their sanctity? Yeah. Do, do they believe us when we say this and we mean what we say and we say what we mean? Yeah. Do they believe in one administration to the other in terms of continuity? In terms of continuity, yeah. do they believe in us? Yeah. Do they believe that this particular head of parastatal or agency facilitating their investment will be there for the next foreseeable future? And even he, if he or she is not there, the next person is not going to um, uh, uproot everything, yeah. roll back, and their money would have, w have wasted yeah. or have been stuck somewhere? Do they have easy exit through the market when they want to repatriate in terms of our foreign exchange of financial markets, liberalization, and policy? All of these make you an attractive investment destination. Yeah. So why do we have investors, instead of stopping in Nigeria with the demography and everything, they go to Ghana, then they fly over, they go to Rwanda, yeah. then they go all the way to Côte Ethiopia. Côte too. Right? Yeah. And they go to Côte d'Ivoire. Mm. And you need to just visit there and you see what is being done. So it's not about policies. I think as a business journalist, I'm tired, and I repeat, I'm tired. For the third time, I'm tired <laughs> of policies. And I'm making that a public statement. I'm tired of policies. We need to behave. We have a enabling business environment, for example. Yes. That the vice president is sounding himself hoarse. He almost lost his voice. Put a responsible and capable person as the head of PEBEC, for example. Yet, you still find agencies and ministries that are not cooperating. How many state governments have bought into the PEBEC initiative fully, which is under the same administration by the same political party. So we have very serious issues beyond policies. I think we spent too many years and time writing policies and talking about policies. This is the time now for us to behave true to the policies that we have on the ground. Now, things are getting more compounded for us by virtue of the AFCFTA and by virtue of this virus. So to go back to this conversation, yes. So now what Mr. Sheye is talking about, very important. Our problem as Nigeria now has been compounded because right now, as soon as this COVID, as far as this COVID is going on, foreign investors are still looking at very viable and soft environment for their investment. It's, there's no stoppage to it. Don't worry about the virus. Businesses and economies are not stopping. Companies are they're discussing, still, they're discussing businesses. But if it's going to take them longer time to get through phone calls, look at our agencies in Nigeria, for example. The Corporate Affairs Commission, the site was down for so long. 
You have many other parastatals that businesses in Nigeria couldn't do anything with during this pandemic. There's no, BCP, there's there's no, there's no, business, business, there's no business, business continuity plan. You make phone calls, market. you make phone calls, mm -hmm. nobody picks it up. You send emails, no one responds. So we are never ready for foreign direct investment. But if we are writing any policy moving forward under the economic sustainability agenda or of the vice president, it has to include how we get ourselves ready. See, so we're not open for business. You are, can be open for business, but you are not ready for business. There are two different things. You can be open. Your, sh your shop is open, right? It is open there. But if your attitude, like the Chinese proverb goes, he said, a man without a smiling face must not open a shop. That's a Chinese proverb I learned long ago. If you don't have a smiling face to welcome investors or to welcome people, excuse me, don't open a shop because who wants to come there and patronize you? Because your eyes are not friendly. So if we're not friendly in approach, in our attitude, in, 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 in our composition, everybody do, don't say, oh, we have too many overlapping functions of all different agencies. At a point, you have 9, 10, 11, 12, almost 15 agencies in, in the, the seaport alone. Okay, yeah. And everybody is trying to check yeah. you. Yeah. Even within customs, for example, once you clear from the port, some guys are waiting for you outside the gates. They say they belong to federal operations. But those who are inside the port, do they belong to local operations? How do you understand? Yeah. So we create too many things. Where will foreign direct investors go there? It's going to be difficult. So for me, uh, Mr. Shea, I'm sorry with you, apologies for, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of policies. I think we should talk about actions now and leave policies alone. Okay, let's okay, talk about the it? actions. What okay. actions do we need to put in place yeah. to get us ready to even implement the foreign direct investment policies that we've written down all these years and decades? Yeah. So Mr. Shea, you can respond and in terms of actions moving beyond policies. I know there have been assurances, even like the central bank governor assured the investors. Before we go to that, I just want to say okay. something on, on the issue of all the flaws that you listed, all the issues, the, 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 the fundamental problems, challenges that are not attractive to foreign investors that you listed. Despite that, why why is the Chinese people, why, why, why are they coming to Nigeria? Why do we still have, uh, why, is, why is MTN operating in Nigeria? Why do we have, uh, why is university, the PSEC, all the manufacturing concerns? So the thing we are saying is that, look, the, the attraction is on ground for us. All we need to do, I agree with you, it's not about policy, I'm not introducing new policy as such, but we are talking about a situation whereby we have foreign investors that are interested in our economy for, for, for an agenda that is not in our interest in the long run. So the issue is that despite the issue of insecurity that we have, here and they are being reported about Nigeria, you still have these people showing interest in Nigeria because they know that this is where, because we have growth potential. So it is our duty to put our house in order such that as they are making profit, we are also improving our own lot. There is no issue. What we should be looking now is that, that how we can structure the foreign investment in Nigeria in a manner that it will serve our long-term interest and it will empower the local investors, you know. So those are the areas we should be looking at because the grant, okay, for present, it was in the news, we saw some Chinese that were involved in legal mining. Are you saying you know, the, the foreigners don't know that the, what they are doing is legal? The thing is that your policies are on ground. It is the duty of the people governing us to put our arms in order such that we, we, we block leakages in the system. All the all the all the government agencies that are working for their own post, we, those are the areas we need to look into, and we should look at the bigger picture. I, uh, of course, there is no there is no nation that even if you know they have their issues, it's just a relative situation. In terms of uh, 
uh, operating environment challenges. It, it's just a question of maybe it's more in one area than the other. If 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 we if we, if we so do an... essentially, how do we say that? Hello? Yes, I, I, I can hear you. Go on. Uh, so I think the, the the emphasis here is that we need to protect the local investors, you know, and the government should evolve strategies, incentives that will them overcome the, the challenge, the the. The, the the problems that has been created by the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. That's the that's my that's my focus in terms of uh, um, in the in the point that the, the, the foreign investors so interested in Nigeria to come and uh, capture the weak assets, the the press institutions, and then they just take the they take away the companies that. Um, and then in the final analysis, when everything settles down, then we uh, people will now start uh, from, from the bottom again. You know, so those are the issues that I, I think we should look at. In terms of um, challenges, if the challenges are, are, are if the challenges are that bad, then we we, we, won't, we won't be an invest, investment destination for foreign investors. I, I think I have a. Uh, well said, sir. These are some of the my, my, the few points here, and, and I just try to highlight them. Uh, if I, I I put about two, three, four guys together today, uh, and decide to go to China to start doing some illegal mining, I'm sure uh, before I do that, I must have some guys on the ground over there who will take me through what it takes. Mm -hmm. So, which means that if you find yeah. illegal miners, then there are collaborators on the inside. So it's an inside job. So let's take that as given. We might be able to capture a few uh, Chinese and say they are doing illegal mining. The, the issue is that on whose behalf are they doing this business? Did they just fly to Nigeria? They know exactly where to go. They brought in equipment and all of that and they're just doing this illegal mining without no single on the ground folks who understand this do, do collaborate with them. I would don't want to believe that as a journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if you look at similar illegal activities in the, uh, in the oil sector, for example, the boys who do the pipeline breaking and what have you, the equipment you need, this, this, this uh, uh, pipelines, the NNPC uh, pipelines or, or DPR uh, uh, pipelines are not what you do with knife or with simple hammer used by, uh, by furniture or carpenters. You need drilling equipment. This equipment costs thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. You need certain skill to be able to do it. Then you need to move, move in the various tankers that's going to offload to this equipment, whether crude or refined products. Mm -hmm. So it's a very intensive, cost-intensive business. You need to have the skill and all of that. Young boys who are just at the bus stop trying to ache out a living through the downfalls and whatever, that's not what they do. They need someone who is bigger at the back end to do it. So if you take the oil and gas sector and we extrapolate that from the mining industry, no foreigners would come here and do illegal mining if we don't have some folks on the ground who are aiding and abetting. So if we take that on one side, then that, the, the second point is that do we have, is the government very sincere about making the necessary policy focus that will protect, like you said, Nigerian investors, promote us, and make sure we have it. And Otto touched about this earlier in his comment. Where is the PIB? Where are we prevaricating in putting this PIB in place, one administration after the other? We're looking at almost 20 years of this. Yeah. We haven't gotten that to the end of it. Some other countries have moved ahead of us. Yes. Why are we prevaricating on PIB for the oil and gas industry, hydrocarbon? Why are we also prevaricating about what we need to do with the mining sector as well? Are we deliberately leaving the gaps open for a few guys inside and outside the country to, to game the country and they're taking advantage why we don't put robust legislation and enforcement on ground to deal with these two critical sectors of extractive industry. That is on one side. Yeah. The third side had to do with foreign direct investment. Now, we have the demography, we have the opportunities and the potentials. So between potentials, opportunities and promise, you need to deliver. If you don't put everything together, opportunity makes a thief. If you, if you, a very good thief looks for opportunities, that's what makes a thief. 
So if we have opportunities and potentials and whatever, yet we are not ready in terms of putting our house in order, as Mr. Sheye says, mm -hmm. rightly said, yeah. then we are not taking advantage of it. The Unilever and the Nestle, they came in here years and decades ago. Mm -hmm. The critical sectors of the economy where we need foreign direct investment, they are not coming in that droves. Infrastructure, power, for example, energy. We're not getting those, infrast we're not getting those investment in, as we ought to get. Everybody knows that 200 million people, if we fix our energy sector or power sector, the money there is as big as you have in the oil and gas sector yes. in terms of the revenue. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the environment that will attract the big uh, 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 energy companies from around the world, the RWE from Germany, the guys from Italy, Spain, and others from Georgia, whatever in the world. They're not coming. They're not here. Mm -hmm. So after we've done the foreign direct investment in the oil and gas and a bit in industrial manufacturing, Decades ago, when Cadbury and the rest came in and Nigerian breweries came in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, we haven't seen any of them coming recently. So we will talk about MTN, for example, and Airtel Africa. That's good. But those are services. Those are services. Those, 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 those are services that continue to. Our manufacturing, industrial manufacturing is, 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 is lagging, but we're, but we're doing more in terms of services. What are we servicing without an industrial backbone? Without the backbone of manufacturing. We need to have the backbone of manufacturing. To, to and to have industrialization manufacturing, we need to fix those issues that make it difficult for them to come in. Yeah. We need the kind of Boeing, Rolls Royce, <laughs> the, uh, the, the Japanese automakers, yeah. the, uh, the uh, Samsung mm. uh, to, to come in here. We need the big companies that can create big jobs. So why do they find it very easy? Uh, for example, there's a, there's a, local, there's a local company in, in Egypt that produces these double-decker buses mm. that you see on the streets of London yeah. that are made in Egypt and they are exported to Britain. Excuse me, we can't build a double-decker bus. Why is uh, Anambra Motor Company, Anamco, Anamco. For, Anamco, for example, that all these years that we can produce a double-decker bus mm. that we can export to, uh, to, to, to the UK yeah. and end foreign exchange? It's a challenging type of work. It, exa exactly. Mm. So, the critical sectors we need for indirect investors or investment, those investors are finding it difficult to come in. So they look at a few edges that are very easy for them to pick. Yeah. Then they come in there and they try to game the system and they make a living. We, I don't think we should take that as, as the fact that, for a fact that yes, we are doing well when it comes to foreign direct investment. Private equity wants to come in here. Venture capitals want to come in here. But they have issues with some of the basic issues we've talked about since we were born. Before some of us were born, some of us who are very young, uh, uh, electricity, roads, we don't have, what well, are the laws around foreclosures? If you have an issue, you take it to court. How long do you take to get, to get permits? How long, how many rules, how many red tapes do you need to go through? If we don't fix these issues, sometimes investors are coming through, they are looking at the exit at the same time. If things go wrong in one year, five years, ten years, and I want to exit, if I take this company to court or I want to get a court order or whatever, how easy will it be for me in Nigeria? So they look at our administration of justice. They look at our administration of justice. They look at our judicial system. And if they find out that, oh, the exit doesn't look as it's going to be easy and fast track for me as it's in Rwanda or Ghana or Ethiopia, they just say sorry. Because it's not enough to get foreign direct investment. There must also be foreign direct exit. So it's both inflows and outflows. So if we don't take care of both the inflows, the meat and the, uh, it's, it's the entire value chain. Yeah. So the upstream, the midstream, and the downstream of our investment market and structure must be well taken care of by policies and the right actions. Mm. It's not enough to say we want to attract investors in. But how do they operate when they're in the country? And when they want to exit downstream, yeah. how easy is it for them to go out and have a judgment delivered on their behalf if they, are in, in, if, they are, if they are in the right. All these form what you call the entire ecosystem mm -hmm. for foreign direct investment. So it's not enough always for us to think of how do we get investors in. But, how do we ensure but if investors, in that investor want to go out, Otto, mm -hmm. uh, do we, if we create the open door like this for him to come in, then the exit door is looking like the eye of a needle <laughs> and you want the camel to pass through it. I don't know if an investor would like that when he wants to go back like with his that. money. 
So, so Mr. Chair, I mean, Mr. Boson has given us a very elaborate uh, insight into his thoughts around our challenges of FDI. And you talked about the need for a well committed response to FDI in terms of policy, which is imperative for Nigeria. If you can just take us to key points of what you want to see happen more from the federal government, from the National Assembly, working together, and particularly we have the window of an economic sustainability plan with the Vice President as the Chairman. What would you like to see happen in all these strategies that will anchor and drive FDI and will see more execution than documents? I think there was a break in transmission along the line. Uh, was the break of okay. your question again? Okay, Mr. Boson has, has given us a very um, thought-provoking perspective on how we should really ramp up in terms of FDIs. And I guess you really heard him very well. But I just want to hear from you because you talked about the need for a well-coordinated policy response at this time. And that will have to do with the executive and the National Assembly working closely. What are those key point areas that we need to be quickly addressed to ensure that we no longer have this policy approach but more execution and investors can really feel that, yes, we can do a lot here in Nigeria? Let me first respond to some of, of the issues that both have raised. Like all the issues you raised, when you talk about the uh, new entrants, I'll be worried about how do I exit when I need to exit. These are the existing players, the, the existing foreign investors. How are they? How are they being coping? Are they, are they been operating just to at a loss or just to please Nigerians without anything accruing to the 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 post the the, the, the source country? So the the issue is, I, I I think we need to, in as much as we have to acknowledge the challenges that are on ground, we must we must admit that some of these people that are complaining about Nigeria. They are not. They are not straight. They, they are not straight business people. Some of them are. They, they are dubious, and when the environment does not allow them to perfect, to to get away with their uh, sharp practices, they they, they 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 come up with all sorts of uh, uh, issues. Those people that are here to do genuine business, that are that, that are long distance runners, not. People that are here just to take advantage, and then once they make a kill, and they they, 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 they get away with uh, uh, they go, they play with that with with what they uh, uh, gain from them. So now the issue is, of course, we all know that there's no way there's no way an external Mr. Chair, can you hear me? To an environment. Okay. Yes, are you there? Yes, go on. You can go on. Hello? Yes, you can go on. Okay. So, okay. So, what I'm saying is that, fine. Any
think we've uh, lost the connection, but I think the major takeaway for him is that anything that has to do with FDI mm. into our country, national interest is very key. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. Hundred percent that we need a. Uh, uh, a national interest, and, and that goes again speaks to my earlier comment. Yes. Uh, are we deliberately leaving certain loopholes mm. for foreigners to take advantage of us in some in very strategic sectors yeah. that will be game changers for us as as, as, a, as a country as a whole? Yeah. An extractive industry is one of it. We have both the the the, the soft commodities, which has to do with agriculture and others. Then we have those that are in the hydrocarbon, which is oil and gas. Then we have the third layer, which has to do with mineral resources. So we have these three extractive industries, kind of. So whether we're processing gold, initiative. So we're putting all these agencies around, and they look very sexy and nice. But in terms of brick and mortar, sorry, in terms of deliverable uh, uh, and, and, and results, it hasn't really really resulted in the benefits that we can actually uh, uh, and I thought we would have learned from the oil and gas industry it's been very messy for the last 40 50 years of doing business in, in oil and gas it's been very very messy yeah. with all the disclosures you keep seeing having during various administrations about whether the uh, you know royalties are being paid on time if we are getting you know, you know petroleum tax mm -hmm. or who is paying whatever whatever to the government yeah. thanks of the JV yeah. the joint venture calls and all what that so it's been very messy mm -hmm. and we said fine let us do a PIB then we've not seen, we saw the beginning of it, we don't see the middle or the end of it. Then we're creating a number of, uh, of reform agenda for the mining industry, yet some of the most important things that they need in that sector, they don't have the mapping. The geophysical uh, reports that, uh, uh, studies that were done, uh, all those uh, years and decades ago, yes. we don't have many of them in the country. Some of them are sitting down there in Britain, mm -hmm. according to very competent sources yeah. within our trade uh, negotiation uh, 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 authority. Yes, yeah. we don't have some of these, so they don't have some of this. So we have quite a lot to do. Investors are just waiting for new or blue oceans like Nigeria yeah. to do uh, extractive business. So we have that on one side. Then we deal with our infrastructure in which we need the big names and those who are real game changers like we discussed yesterday about uh, solar, yeah. <laughs> about renewable, yeah. renewable energy. Yeah. There are billions and billions and billions of dollars sitting down in various agencies and institutions, DFIs, uh, energy companies around the world that wants to invest in renewable energy. Mm -hmm. The question is that why are they not flocking to Nigeria like low costs? As expected. Yeah. As ex as expected. Mm -hmm. These are critical issues here. Yeah. I don't want us to use, to get carried away by a few people doing foreign direct investment in Nigeria. Our potentials are just as wide as the Pacific Ocean, mm. but the results we are getting are so narrow. One billion dollars last year, they translated about $250 million per quarter. A country of 200 million people. That goes about, so let's say that's about $1 million per person. Excuse me. What does that fix in any of us, of our lives? Uh, for each individual, for every Nigeria. So if we share the FDI per capita for last year, what comes to each Nigerian in terms of healthcare, right, medicine, pharmaceutical, education, uh, uh, social safety net, uh, infrastructure, energy, this well-being, pensions, retirement. So if you share the FDI per capita, you find out that it's very minute in terms of what each and every one of us needs to use to have a decent and meaningful life moving forward. So if you break the FDI down, it comes to almost zero for each one of us. Yeah. So we therefore need to take a second look at it and say, look, yeah, we have a few Chinese coming in here, opening restaurants and a few other things, yes. Those are the low end of the fruits, the lower hanging fruits, they can fix it. The critical issues that every multilateral agency have asked Nigeria to restructure the economy and do both fiscal structure, restructure our monetary policies and all of that, yeah. trade. They know what they're talking about. They can, see a few, they can see a few people making money, they can, but they can see the wider blue ocean of potentials that we're sitting on, and everybody's just folding their hands around the world and say, how could a country have so much to offer, yet the people are not woken up in terms of leadership, to be able to take advantage of it, strategic leadership, 
taking strategic decisions at every point in time, decisions that are forward-looking for, for the country. That is the issue here. We're talking about $400 billion GDP for a country of 200 million people. Break it down to per capita. Mm -hmm. What does it really bring us to? It's almost zero. It's very minute. Yeah. What is our GDP per capita income? It's almost zero. So if we break the big, big numbers down, we find out that they all amount to near zero. Our productivity is so low. So if we have such big foreign direct investment, how come our productivity is so low? The Chinese are not going to want to build this economy. They are not going to be the ones to run the SMEs for us or the MSMEs. It's going to be you and I, our uncles, our children, our brothers, our friends, and others. So it's not the Chinese. So we shouldn't look at just the Chinese as the ones who's going to build it or a few foreigners. No, it is we. So I agree with him yeah. that we need to keep putting Nigerians at the heart of our foreign direct investment. And that's why I like the NIPC. It's not just about FDI. But what about the, uh, the DDI? Yeah. Yes, we, we, we need both to, to, to come in. But even for local investors, we still need the right environment and the right actions. Even for you, Otto, if you have the money, <laughs> you, you still want... A good environment. Well, we still want a good environment. Yeah. Very, I find, find Nigeria setting up businesses in South Africa, in Ghana, and other places that should have been here. Yeah. Again, because, well, a few of them are trying to hide away <laughs> the funds, stolen funds. But, but a few yeah, people yeah. are genuinely interested. I really enjoyed the, the perspectives from you and uh, Mr. Shea. We lost connection with him, but hopefully in the, in the course of the month or even next month, we'll still have him to discuss about this. But FDIs are very important. Uh, when the environment is right and everything is set, FDIs will come. And of course, it must be for our own interest, national interest. I agree. Job creation and inclusive growth. So that will be all this conversation today in the market review, looking at post-COVID-19 attracting foreign direct investment into Nigeria. We had Mr. Shea Adetunli, Chief Responsibility Officer for Value Investing Limited and convener of the Capital Market Roundtable. With us in the studio was a co-anchor, Mr. Boson Mopaye, CEO of Frontier Capital Sports. It was nice having you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We'll continue this conversation tomorrow, but you can log on to our website, www.proshain.com, to watch our videos and also get reports and analysis and news stories from Nigeria's leading financial information hub. Till we come your way again, thank you for watching. Have a nice day and stay safe.